Welcome to another YouTube tutorial on financial modeling. Now, before we get into this specific lesson, I want to start with a brief announcement. And I actually want to start off by saying thank you, because as I record this, our channel just actually reached over 10,000 subscribers, or close to 400,000 views, which is pretty amazing. When we started this a year and a half or two years ago, I really didn't think it would get to this level. And I am amazed and humbled that it has. So thank you for going through the channel and watching as much as you have. And we will be adding more in the coming years, updating the channel and adding more videos and more tutorials and lessons each month. So thanks for subscribing, for watching everything and for engaging and asking questions. We're always looking to improve what's here. So we will be producing more videos, improving the video quality, improving the audio quality and more coming up soon. Now, since we just passed this milestone, I want to cover in this lesson a very, very common topic that we get a lot of questions about, which is IPO valuation. Now, this comes up whenever a company announces plans to go public, announces plans for a public offering, whether it goes through or not. And we'll often get questions from students and professionals who come to us and say, how does an IPO valuation work? How is it different from a discounted cash flow analysis how is it different from public company comparables or precedent transactions? And the truth is that it's not, and there's also no such thing as an IPO valuation. Now, you can certainly have a model that shows what happens in an initial public offering transaction, but this moniker of IPO valuation is somewhat misleading because it's not really a valuation methodology in the same way that a DCF or public comps or precedent transactions are. So we're not dealing with a different methodology here. What we are dealing with is a model for a transaction that relies upon the output from those other methodologies. So for example, in an IPO model, which we'll be getting into here, we have to assume some type of valuation multiple for the company that is going to go public. And that in large part is going to be based on the multiples from comparable public companies. So an IPO model certainly accepts as input the output from those other methodologies, but by itself, it's not exactly used to value a company and to tell you what its equity value and enterprise value might be. The real value of an IPO model is that you can use some of that valuation output from other methodologies to draw conclusions about what percentage of itself the company might have to sell, about the offering price, about the number of shares that might have to be issued, and other points like that. So if you set this up, and I'll keep labeling this an IPO valuation model just because that's a common search term, a common way to refer to it, even though it's not quite accurate. If you want to set this up, we're going to go through an example here for a Korean company, Kakao, makers of the Kakao Talk application a mobile messaging app, they were considering an IPO in the middle of one year. And we're going to take this as an example. This comes directly from one of the key studies in our courses on private company valuation and financial modeling and considerations there. We're going to focus on the numbers and what you can actually tell from the model. We're not going to focus quite as much on the process and the rationale behind all the numbers, or this would turn into a four hour lesson. So our plan here is going to be to start with the rationale and the setup for the model. I'll show you one way to model the transaction, and then I will show you an alternate way to model it that is not as accurate or realistic maybe, but maybe a little bit easier for you to follow and understand. The main problem I've seen with a lot of the IPO models and IPO valuations online is that they give you a model that shows what happens in a transaction, but they don't really start it out the right way. It's typical for these models to start with the offering price and the number of shares the company plans to issue. And actually in one of the versions of this model that we look at, this alternate IPO model over here, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna start with how many shares they plan to issue and then the offering price per share, $25 to $40, and then figure out how many shares will be outstanding post IPO, what the company's value might be, and all sorts of other information like that. And that's fine. The problem though, is how do you determine what the offering price is actually gonna be? 
And putting that aside, how do you even determine how many shares the company is going to issue? If you haven't spoken to them and you don't know much about what's going on here, this is a shot in the dark. You have absolutely no way to tell what these inputs are going to be unless you've already completed the valuation, you have an idea of the multiples, and you know what multiples this range of offering prices and the number of shares they plan to issue here actually correspond to. So setting it up like I just showed you with the offering price and the number of shares does make it easier and more straightforward to understand, but it's not really how companies think about the process. If a company is raising capital or is about to go public and also raising capital, therefore, what they are really concerned about is number one, how much capital do we want to raise? And then number two, at what valuation can we raise it? The reason why this is important is because when you sell equity in your company, when your company is going public and you sell equity to raise funding instead of raising debt, for example, you are giving up an ownership percentage in your company. So if you want to raise a billion dollars and your company is worth $3 billion, you're going to sell less of the company in the process because this billion dollars represents a smaller portion of a $3 billion company. Whereas if your company's valuation is $2 billion, you're going to end up selling more of the company because this billion dollars represents a higher percentage of this company's total value. So these are the two key questions you have to ask. And in our opinion, they're really the best way to set up a model like this. Although we will look at that alternate method that I've been mentioning. So with this type of model, step number one is to determine the capital to raise and the fees. Then you figure out the valuation and other terms. If you're wondering about those valuation multiples, they're typically based on forward multiples. So if we're in 2015 now, we would use the forward 2016 estimated multiple. If we're in 2035, we'd use the estimated 2036 multiple. And we'd look at the public company comparables and say, okay, the median PE multiple for next year is 20X. The minimum is 15, the maximum is 25. So we're probably gonna price our company somewhere in that range. And that's probably about what its valuation multiple should be. Once you have that, then you can use these numbers to back into the number of shares issued, the offering price, and other key metrics like that that you're going to use in this model. So with that all said, let's jump back into Excel now and actually go through this and I'll show you how all the math works. There are a couple other points that we'll go through as we cover this model. As always, I have written notes in Excel over here on the side. You can download this file right below the video. If you click on show more under the description and then go to the bottom under resources, you'll see a link right there. And I've divided this into steps and I have some notes here just on additional points that we're probably not gonna get to cover in this tutorial, just for your future reference. So as I said, the starting point is typically a forward multiple. Here, we've looked at some other social networking and mobile messaging app companies and come up with this range of 17.5 to 25x for the one year forward PE multiples. So our assumption here will be that when Kakao, this Korean company, that's why we're listing everything in Korean won on the side, when it actually goes public, it will be trading at a multiple in this range of 17.5x to 25x price to earnings. So the first thing that we do is figure out how much the company will actually be worth when it is treated as a public company after it has already raised capital. So this is the post money equity value at trading. And to determine this, we can just take their net income and multiply by this PE multiple. Because remember, PE is just equal to equity value over net income, also price per share over earnings per share. So we're just reversing that and flipping it around a little bit here. So we have the post money equity value at trading. Now, the next thing we need to factor in is that before the company goes public, early investors in them will typically get to buy shares in the company at some type of discount to account for the added risk because they don't know what's going to happen to the share price when the company goes public. The company is less liquid at this stage, right when they're raising capital from investors on a roadshow and getting commitments before they're a publicly traded entity. And so typically you assume some type of pricing discount. So when they go public, they'll be worth a certain amount, but when they're still raising capital and they're still selling shares, they are going to be worth less, or at least investors buying shares at this point will get more of a bargain when they actually buy shares. 
You often assume 15% for this pricing discount if you're in a developed market, so a US or UK listing, for example. But even in a lot of foreign markets, you'll still see assumptions somewhere in this range. You would obviously have to look at comparable deals and issuances to really get a good handle on this, but we're gonna say 15% for now. Copy this across. And then we need to see what this discounted equity value is gonna be before they actually start trading as a public company. So we'll take the post money equity value at trading, divide by one plus this discount of 15%, copy this across. And then for the pricing discount amount, we can just take our post money value at trading and subtract our post money value at pricing right here. And copy this across. So we have our discount, we have our post money values at pricing and trading. The reason these are called post money values is because we're assuming here that the company has already raised capital. As a result of raising that capital, their equity value is pushed up higher. So that's why we have called this post money equity value. Now, for the next part in this, we need to think about what their offering price per share is going to be. This is not what the share price of the publicly traded company is going to be. It's going to be at what price can institutional investors like BlackRock and Fidelity and others buy shares in the company before they are officially publicly traded. While they're on the roadshow selling shares in the company, what are they selling them for? To determine this, we can take our post money equity value pricing and then just subtract our funds raised in IPO here. We're assuming it's a billion dollar offering. We don't really have time to get into the rationale for this here, but the company determines it based on their goals, how they're gonna use the funds and other factors like that. So I'm gonna take our post money equity value pricing and subtract that billion dollars because remember raising this money will push up the company's equity value since cash is implicitly reflected in equity value. So we'll take this and then divide by the existing shares outstanding. So the numerator here is really what the company's equity is worth before it goes public. And the denominator is the same. It shows the number of shares the company has before it goes public. So we're trying to match the numerator and denominator to show what happens at the instant before they go public. And that gets us our implied offering price per share ranging from about 25 to 42 or $43. The next thing to think about is the mix between primary secondary shares and also the green shoe option or the over allotment option. The idea here is that primary shares are brand new shares created and sold to new investors for the purpose of raising capital. Secondary shares are sold by existing investors who want to sell their stake in the company to other investors, but they don't directly help the company raise capital because it's just other investors that already own shares trading their shares with someone else. So the primary share percentage refers to the capital the company is going to raise. The secondary shares are just ancillary and they don't contribute to the company actually raising capital. Now there's also something called a green shoe provision, which says that essentially if there's very strong demand, the banks running the IPO can increase the number of shares that are being issued. So they can help the company raise even more capital if there's strong demand by increasing it by some percentage. This is often set to 15% if the company and banks involved choose to exercise it. And of course, you can also have this allocated between primary shares and secondary shares, existing shares that are held by investors that are selling to other investors in the deal. So to determine all this, we can take the post money equity value at pricing, divide by the offering price per share, and then subtract the existing shares outstanding. For the secondary shares, since we know that secondary takes up 25%, we can just take our primary number and divide by the primary share percentage and then subtract that primary number. And then we can add these up. This gives us a total share sold, but again, only the primary shares actually result in capital being raised for the company. Now, we also have to factor in that over allotment option. We're working backwards to get to it here. So we're gonna take our total shares issued or sold in the IPO and then divide by one plus the green shoe provision of 15%. And that will get us to the total number of shares. The over allotment shares is just our total minus the total in the base deal. And if you run the math, you'll see that the over allotment shares here is always equal to 15% times this number at the top. And then for the total shares post IPO, we can just take our post money equity value of pricing, divide by our offering price per share, and that gets us that number over here. 
for determining the split between the basic offering and the over allotment for both the primary and secondary shares. For the primary shares, we're gonna take the total over allotment shares and then multiply by what percentage of these actually correspond to the primary allocation. And then for the secondary shares, we're gonna take the over allotment shares and multiply by one minus this primary allocation percentage up here. And then for the basic offering, we can just take our primary shares and subtract the over allotment shares. And then same for the secondary shares, we can just take our total secondary minus the over allotment and then copy all those across. So we have the rough split. Going back to what I said earlier in those slides, the IPO valuation is not really telling us what the company should be worth. We already know what multiple it should trade at. What it's really telling us is information like this. What is the split between different share types? What is the company's offering price going to be? Just how many shares actually have to be issued or sold in the IPO? And that's really the point of a model like this. Now, to go down and finish off more of this, we can also look at the deal size, gross, and net proceeds to the issuer. We want to factor in the fees that the bank is going to charge and also the deal-related fees and ultimately figure out what percent of the company is going to be sold in the IPO at different valuations, which is really the whole point of this type of model. So for the base deal size, we're just going to take our total shares issued or sold up here in the base deal and then multiply by the offering price per share. Then we'll take our over allotment shares and multiply by that same offering price per share. And then we can add these up. So this gets us the total offering size. And since we're targeting a certain amount of capital raised here, this doesn't change regardless of what the PE multiple that the company is priced at actually is. All that really changes here is how many primary shares are issued. And that's the key to really getting something out of this model. The gross primary proceeds, remember this corresponds to how much capital the company really raises in the deal. We'll take the primary shares issued times the offering price per share. For the underwriting discount, this is typically a percentage of the gross primary proceeds. Banks do not charge a commission on secondary shares for the most part. They're gonna, only gonna charge it when they actually sell new shares to investors. So we'll take the gross primary proceeds and multiply by the underwriting discount of 5%, the IPO spread here. And then we'll also go up and subtract the IPO related fees, filing and registration fees, accounting, legal, and other fees like that. And then we can add up everything here to get our net IPO proceeds to the issuer. And then the key part of this model actually is the implied pre-money equity value. So this is what the company was worth, what its equity was worth before it actually raised capital from investors before it became a publicly traded entity. To get this, we can take our post money equity value at pricing up here and then subtract the primary proceeds down here. So this is what the company was worth before it raised capital. And then to figure out the percent sold in the IPO, we can just take the primary proceeds and divide by the post money equity value at pricing. We're not dividing by the trading value here because what's relevant is they sold the shares to new investors before the company became a publicly traded entity. And so that is when they actually gave up some ownership. So we have that and we can copy this across. So we can see here, I'll just go up and set up a frame once again. We can see here that regardless of what the PE multiple is, the company is going to be selling around 25 to 26% up to 37 or 38% of their company if they want to raise a billion dollars in this IPO in the current valuation environment. And those are the types of conclusions that you really use an IPO model to determine. So again, it's not about valuation, it's really about using the output of a valuation analysis and figuring out points like this. How much of the company has to be sold, how much in primary and secondary shares will be issued and other things like that. And then the last thing we can do here is just take a look at these valuation multiples at pricing and trading. We always like to do this and then compare these to the public comps because we want to make sure that by assuming this range of PE multiples, we haven't come up with something completely unreasonable. So for the post money equity value at trading, let's just go up and take it from right here. And then we'll subtract the IPO proceeds, the net proceeds here after fees and commissions. And then we can get our post money enterprise value at trading. 
This is a lot lower because of course the IPO proceeds consist of cash. And as you know, cash is going to push down enterprise value or more accurately, if a company has a lot of cash and no debt or very little debt, its enterprise value is gonna be less than its equity value. And then for the values at pricing, we can go up and get our post money equity value at pricing and then just take this number and make all the same set of adjustments that we had up here and get to our post money enterprise value at pricing like that and copy this across. And I've calculated all the multiples here just to save a bit of time. We'd have to go in and compare these to the public comps. But in this case, if you look at social networking and mobile messaging app companies, these seem very reasonable. So our conclusion would be that our range of multiples here and the amount of capital raised and the fact that the company is planning to sell between 25 and 35 to 40% of itself in the IPO, those all seem reasonable and are fairly standard for initial public offerings. So that's the first version of the model I wanted to show you. I'm gonna show you briefly an alternate IPO model now. In this one, it's gonna be based on the offering price and the share sold instead. The problem, of course, is that to figure out this offering price, you need to know the valuation multiples. There's no way to guess it. You can't just go out there and hope that someone will come down from the sky and give you an answer on what to price the company at or how much its share should be worth. It has to be tied back to the valuation in some way. So in our opinion, it's a little bit silly to set it up like this because you need some linkage to the valuation, but you will see it done this way as well. It is a little bit easier to understand the flow of the model like this and also the primary, secondary, and green shoe distinctions. So let's go to this alternate IPO model tab in Excel. You can see that we're still using many of these same assumptions. The financial metrics, the underwriting discount, the pricing discount, the green shoe and primary allocation, but now we're assuming a certain number of primary and secondary shares sold and we've set the offering price per share to $25 to $40, roughly in line with our prices before. And now you can really see how the over allotment provision works, for example, because if we go up and let's say that we went back and we set this to 0%, let's say, well, in this model, we'd get no additional shares from that over allotment provision. So that's how it works. And it might be a little bit clearer to understand the flow because of that because here we're starting with the number of shares and then we increase them depending on whether or not that green shoe or over allotment provision actually exists. I'm gonna change this back for now. We get to our total shares that's standing like this. And then as with the other model, our post money equity value at pricing differs as does our post money equity value at trading. But this time it's because we've picked a different offering price, not a different PE multiple. We still have the pricing discount and down here, we can see that the amount of capital raised is now different because we're issuing the same number of shares, but we're doing it at different offering prices each time. So the philosophy behind this version of the model is quite a bit different. The percent of the company sold stays the same at 34%, which is very reasonable for an IPO like this. And then if you go down even further, you can see that the valuation multiples overall that you get from this are pretty close to what we had before. So this isn't necessarily a better way to set up the model. It's just a different way to do it. And it might make it a little bit easier for you to understand the flow and what's going on here. This first version involved a lot of working backwards and some things that may not make sense initially. So I think this other version will help you understand the concepts in more detail. Let's do a recap and summary now. The truth is that there is no such thing as IPO valuation. The point of an IPO model is to take output from evaluation and then figure out other things about the transaction and the company. A lot of the models you'll see will start with the offering price and the number of shares the company plans to issue. It's easier to understand, but it's not really how companies think about the process. How they really think about it is how much capital do they need to raise and at what valuation can they raise it? Obviously, they want to raise as much capital as they can at the highest valuation they can to minimize the amount of ownership in their company they give up. So typically in an IPO model, you figure out the capital to raise and the fees, you figure out the valuation based on comparable public companies, and then you work backwards to get the shares issued, the offering price, and so on and so forth. Factoring in the trading versus pricing distinction, primary and secondary shares, and the green shoe option. 
A slightly easier to understand method is this alternate IPO model based on the offering price and the share sold instead. So definitely take a look at that. It's a little bit easier to understand the flow and both versions of this model will help you as you learn more about this concept. So thanks for watching this lesson and we hope to see you again soon.